I'm used to people singing count your many blessings when I finally shut up and sit down. Uh, I, I like the idea of you leading it beforehand, brother. Um, we're going to be in Acts 28. We'll be there a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk in different ways this morning. And it is good to see each of you. I know we still have many out of town and so forth, but it's a beautiful spring morning. And it's delightful to be together. I, I remember this past week that a year ago, Vice President Pence and the rest of the Coronavirus Task Force stood in the White House briefing room and said, we need to stay home for 14 days to slow the spread. And I believe them. And now, a year into it, we're finally starting to see the end of the tunnel. I remember very distinctly, I, I had this routine going that I would go to the gym, do yoga on Tuesday and Friday, then I would swim. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'd lift weights and then I would swim. And then I would go and drive for Uber, Lyft for a couple hours or so. And the last day that was my routine was March the 17th of 2020. I went to yoga that morning and I was the only one that showed up. I remember I wore a green tank top just because it was St. Patrick's Day, all right? I remember that. And you got to understand that I am the youngest one in this class by probably 30 years or so. I, I kid you not. And my senior classmates were concerned about COVID. And so I'm the only one there that morning. And I tell the instructor, you know, I, you don't have to do yoga just for me this morning. And so I'll, I'll go swim. It's a good thing that I went and swam that morning because the gym closed a few hours later. And in fact, it closed for good. It has not opened back up and they will not open back up. They closed as a casualty of the pandemic. My life changed that day because Tammy started staying home. Being a librarian, she couldn't very well teach remotely, and there wasn't a whole lot for her to do. Wilson, our son, whom you have not met, began remote learning, and like many young people, he did not walk for his graduation. He got a little YouTube video, and that was graduation. And... I know that I'm not the only one in here whose life changed a year ago. Many of you started staying home. Whether you worked remotely or some of you may have been laid off. You may have started to have kids at home 24-7 and wondering how you're going to survive. But perhaps the largest, biggest change was church. No longer were we meeting three times a week. Y'all were meeting on Sunday morning only through Zoom, online. Where we were worshiping, we stayed home the first Sunday and worshiped together as a family. Got a call during that week that the next Lord's Day, we would assemble as a congregation in the parking lot couldn't get out of our cars, but we would roll down our windows and sing a couple hymns together and hear the word preached, take the Lord's Supper together. Service might last a half hour and we'd assemble as a body as we could and worship. Now I pray that the end is in sight. As we are getting vaccines, 
as we're heading toward herd immunity. Governor Abbott has opened up businesses and so forth, 100% capacity. Maybe we're seeing the end of social distance. And we've got to ask the question, where do we go from here? I, I, I mean, really, how do we start reconnecting with people we haven't seen? How do we start to reconnect with folks we've not talked to in a year? We've not hugged in a year. How do we go about reconnecting? I think Paul provides a good example of this principle. God, you see, created us as social beings. God did not intend us to live in isolation. He did not intend for us to have social distancing and to live apart from each other. God made us to live in fellowship with one another. Genesis 2, 18. The Lord, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. It is not good for the man to be alone. At that time, Adam's the only human on earth. And God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians, recounting his ministry among them, he says, 1 Thessalonians 2.8, because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul and his traveling companions shared not just the gospel with the Thessalonians, but Paul said we shared our lives with you. Paul, though, is now a prisoner. He's on his way to Rome. A journey of some 2,250 miles. Taking four months. The only ones with him are Luke and Aristarchus. Besides Luke and Aristarchus, Paul is alone. He's by himself. And Paul desperately needs other Christians. And as he gets to Rome, Paul provides us an example of how we can connect with other people. After a year being apart, how that you reconnect and come after an time. I say that, because of Acts 28.15, notice Paul's reaction. Paul wasn't just, oh, hey, how are you? But Scripture says, at the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Paul thanked God and was encouraged. What a blessing it would be if we, coming back together after a year apart, could thank God and be encouraged. And Paul gives us an example of how we can do that. And here's what the Apostle teaches us. Christians need connection with other Christians. Christians need connection with other Christians. Research shows that if a new convert doesn't have six friends within a couple months, he's gone. Forget it. He's out the back door. Because God made us as social beings. And we need that connection with one another. 
And Paul gives us an example. Now, at this point, we typically go to our text, we'd exegete it, look at the teaching of Scripture, and then we'd come back and we'd make application. And this text doesn't lend itself very easily to that because the text itself is a travel law of how Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus get from Malta to Rome. And so what we're going to do this morning is to think about the application. To think about these principles we learned from the text and how we can apply them in this century as we think about ending social distancing and coming back together, reconnecting with brethren because we understand we need that connection. How do we do so? First of all, if you want to reconnect with brethren, you need a craving. You need a craving that is a desire. You have to want to reconnect with brethren. It's not that, oh, well, yeah, i got to put up with those folks over there again. You want to do it. You want to connect. Acts 28 14. At Puteoli, we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them. These brethren at Puteoli wanted this relationship with Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus. They came together and had that craving, and therefore they did something about it. They invited the three of them, those three brethren, to spend a week with them because they wanted to be together. If we are to connect with brethren, we have to have a craving. And you have to understand, you must understand, that God always intended His people to live in communion and fellowship with one another. No man is an island. God never intended us as Christians to be apart. I, I, I know for some with health issues and other things, it's still not possible to be together. I, I, I get that. I know that. But this isn't what God intended. God intended us to live in communion. Acts 2, 42 and 46. The early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The brethren of Jerusalem were together. They were sharing life. were in one another. Romans 12 another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Honor one another in love. Love each other. Live in communion with one another. Hebrews 13 1 Keep on loving as brothers and sisters. Keep on loving one another. You reconnection. Do you really want to reconnect with brothers and sisters? 
Let's try to create that craving just a second. Think back over this last stressful year. You and I, if we're traveling, we'll go and we'll stay at a hotel. You know, the Holiday Inn Express here in town is really nice. It really is. I mean, I stayed there. It's nice. But that wasn't the way inns worked in the first century. They were houses of disrepute. This is that ladies of the night worked. I mean, that was their business place. It was their office. Men of the night as well in that day and age, they, they just were not places that Christians could go to and stay. It'd be like if when I came down to talk to the elders, they put me up in a strip bar. Okay, that, That's not where a Christian goes. But that's what ends were in that day and age. Okay, I mean, that's what you need to think of. And so, when Christians would travel, they weren't going to stay at a hotel. They weren't going to stay at an inn, by and large. Instead, they were going to stay with other brethren. And notice that's true in the Greco-Roman world, in Judea. You know, Mary and Joseph go to an inn. The Good Samaritan takes the man to an inn. They were different in Palestine and in, in Israel than elsewhere. In the rest of the world, the Christians you just couldn't go there couldn't stay there. And so Christians would open up their homes. And the brethren Puteoli opened up their home to Luke, Paul, and Aristarchus served their need. You have to be willing to meet the needs of brethren. If you want to reconnect with brethren, there's no better way to do so than serving them. It's not that everybody's supposed to come and serve us. I visited with a lady one time, and I can be a smart aleck, so I really have to watch what I say. And this lady was bemoaning the fact that she had been in the hospital, and not a single person from church had come to visit her. And Justin ask the question, how many people in the bulletin have you been to see this week? You know what her answer was. Nobody. Isn't that the way people often view service? Let people come and serve me. Let them come and wait on me. Rather than let me go and serve them. And brothers and sisters, your duty as a Christian is not to be served, but to serve. Jesus came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. Our Lord taught us to be servants. Mark 10, 43, 44. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Muhammad Ali would talk about himself as the greatest. May have been the greatest boxer ever to live. He was a Kentuckian after all. Good boxer. Great boxer. But Jesus says greatness doesn't come from being a boxer. Greatness doesn't come from oratory. Greatness doesn't come from being important. Greatness comes from serving. If you want to be the greatest Christian in the world, serve other people. That's how you do it. If you want to be great, the greatest, serve. John 13, 14. After Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. You don't want to have to see my feet. Tammy will tell you that. First time she saw me barefooted, she wondered if she could marry me with those ugly feet. I, I kid you not. 
Jesus isn't talking about washing feet literally. You understand that was the job of a slave. Nobody there at the table was willing to wash each other's feet. Nobody would take that job. That's what a slave did. And here is the Creator of all getting up from dinner, wrapping a towel around His waist, and washing the feet of His disciples. God in the flesh did the work of the slave. And Jesus says, don't think you're too good to serve. Because if the Creator can serve, so can you. That's where greatness comes. It comes by serving. Galatians 6.2 Carry one another's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. Serve one another. Comfort one another. Just as the brethren of Puteoli served the Apostle Paul and helped him. How can you comfort your brothers and sisters? How can you serve them? Think about what can you do this week for someone in this assembly right now? Do something for one person in this assembly this week. Serve. Wrap the towel around your waist and serve. Think about who's not here this morning. Use your talents this week to serve one person. There are a variety of reasons people aren't here. Traveling, health, concern, other things. But God has bestowed you with special talents. You can serve people differently than other people can. How can you serve this week? Be like Jesus. Be like the Lord. And serve. If you want to reconnect with brethren, you also need a commitment. You need a commitment. It's not going to happen just if you sit on the couch and let it go. It's something you have to work for. It's something you have to decide you want. Brother, I want you to notice Acts 28, 15 very carefully. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the form of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. It doesn't mean a whole lot, does it? Understand the geography there and it begins to mean something. Both the form of Appius and the three taverns were on the Appian Way, a famous Roman road. The form of Appius was 43 miles from Rome. Three taverns was 33 miles. You know, it's not that difficult to hop in the car and go 33 miles. Not that difficult to go 43 miles. But what if you had to walk that distance to go see somebody? Would you be willing to walk 43 miles to meet somebody give them a hug, and greet them. That's what the brethren here did for Paul. They made a commitment. They said, we want to reconnect with Paul. Paul is in prison. Paul is going to Rome to be tried. 
He was there for two years, we're told, likely because accusers never showed up. The case was dismissed. Likely what we're to understand, Mandy. Then, of course, he was imprisoned again and beheaded a second time. Arrested a second time, not beheaded the second time, just arrested that second time. But here, the brethren come to Paul, make a commitment to greet him, to connect with him, because he is alone. They go through effort to greet the apostle. You need to make a commitment, desire, really want to reconnect with brothers and sisters in Christ. The Good Samaritan made an effort, made a commitment. Luke 10, 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He didn't just wish him well. He didn't pass by on the other side. He didn't just take care of him in the moment. But rather, the Good Samaritan made a commitment. Put the man on his own donkey. Took him to an inn, took care of him. Then when he left, we don't know how long he took care of him. Yeah, it's a parable, but still the idea is he took care of him. And then when he left, he gave the innkeeper money and, and said, look, you know, if the guy charges anything else, just, just put it on my tab. He made a commitment to help. And he did. The household of Stephanus made a commitment to connect with brethren. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia. And they had devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. They have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. They made a commitment to serve the people of God. You know, those greens in the epistle sometimes contain beautiful nuggets of gold. This is one of them. Stephanus, his household, made a commitment and served the people of God. Devoted themselves to serving people of God. How can you this morning make a commitment to reconnect with brothers and sisters? Not just going to happen. You're going to have to put in some work. What brother can you pick the phone up and call? Invite maybe to a cup of coffee. What brother or sister can you drive across town to visit? What brother can you write a note to and say, I miss you, I love you, I can't wait to get together? Whom can you make that commitment to? I want to reconnect with you. I want to be with you. We're brethren. And we'll join together. Christians, you see, need connection with other Christians. We cannot, we dare not just live in isolation. We can't do it. We have to live in fellowship. The ending of Acts tells us a great deal, I believe, about reconnecting with brethren. Paul is under house arrest for two years. You know, we thought one year in isolation was difficult. Paul's there for two. He's chained to a Roman guard. He talks about his chains as he talks to uh, Jewish leaders up earlier in this chapter. And he can't do whatever he wants. He doesn't have freedom. 
probably saying in an apartment. Some translations say house, others rented quarters. That's a better translation of Greek. But notice what we read in Acts 28, 30, and 31. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You see what Paul did? He couldn't go to people, they came to him. He welcomed them, the text says. What else did he do? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Paul knew that Christians need connection with other Christians. Paul knew that he needed other brothers and sisters to fellowship with. And so what did he do? He sought to make other brothers and sisters. He taught the Word that others might come to know Jesus. That he might have a wider circle of connection. Can we not do the same? Maybe share the truth with a friend, co-worker, family. Maybe share the truth by the way that you live. Show that you belong to Jesus. You know, sometimes our job is to make people thirsty for the gospel. Do that by the way you live your life. How are you living your life this morning? Do you need connection with other Christians? Do you need to connect with the blood of Jesus? You need to come this morning. Would you come right now as we stand and sing?